Okay, so Mr. Flynn has asked me to talk about some topics from um, the history of cheating. So I'll start off with um, the debate over urine enhancing drugs, and that's under teaching cheating in education. And urine enhancing drugs are commonly referred to as nootropics. Um, now, the, de the definition of nootropics states that it's a substance that enhances cognition and memory and facilitates learning. But the important th thing to consider is that it's not going to give you artificial intelligence and magically make you smarter, but it's only going to boost your cognition and enable you to concentrate for a prolonged period of time. Suppose like for one total it's 24 hours. And um, the three um, major types of nootropics that you'll come across are Ritalin, Adderall, and Modafinil, or also known as Provigil. These are all prescription drugs, and Adderall and Ritalin are used to treat ADD, ADD or ADHD, and Modafinil is for narcolepsy. Now the off-label uses for all these drugs are as neuroenhancing drugs. Um, this whole PowerPoint is going to be quite text heavy because I'm going to put on the Google Drive so then people can look at it later on. And I'm also going to use quotes from learned people and I'm going to um, reference them with the following letter. So if you just want to take a photo of this or anything, but it's going to be on the Google Drive. So I'm going to treat this um, as if it were a debate. And I'll talk about the benefits first, and then I'll move on to the disadvantages. So in terms of benefits, the major benefit that is blatantly obvious is that it does boost performance. And it can be stated that it helps you to become more intelligent. There is several evidence to back this up. Just one Cambridge, um, one Cambridge experiment in 2002, they took 60 healthy individuals, and they gave them a battery of cognit cognitive tests. One subgroup was under the influence of modafinil, and the other subgroup wasn't. The subgroup under the influence of modafinil performed a lot better in all of these tests. Now, Farah published a paper. She took evidence from 40 different laboratories regarding modafinil's use, and she looked at three different types of cognition. The first type of cognition that she looked into was learning. This is simply memorizing keywords and key facts, and people under the influence of modafinil perform significantly better in terms of this type of cognition. The second type of cognition she looked into was working memory. This is likened to a mental scra um, scratch pad. It's the same type of cognition that lawyers have to use on a, daily, on a daily basis when they're asking witnesses questions, and they're using those answers to formulate arguments. Yet again, modafinil or other neuroenhancing drugs enable you to perform much better in this type of cognition. And lastly, cognitive control was the last type of cognition that she looked into. And yet again, using modafinil enabled you to perform better. And cognitive control, these tests are similar to when you see um, the word yellow on the board, but the font color is in green, and you have to say what the word says. Tests like these. So in all three types of cognition, the use of neuroenhancing drugs helps benefit your performance. Now the definition of intelligence is the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills. And I feel that these three types of cognition really do summarize the definition of intelligence. So neuroenhancing drugs make you more intelligent. Secondly, it is similar to other advantages that we have as a society right now. First of all, in the, as the, for the example of students, students who partake in more activities, physical activities, and who have a better diet, tend to have um, neurons that are placed more effectively within their brain and perform better in cognitive tests. Now, neuroenhancing drugs only provide this ability in the form of a pill. So it is quite fair to enable its distribution. Now, there's one argument I came across, which was students who have poor vision and wear glasses can be compared to those who aren't as, intel who aren't as intelligent and take nootropics. And also stimulants, such as vitamin D and coffee, these also boost cognition. So if you were to ban nootropics, why wouldn't you ban um, vitamin D, or why wouldn't you ban coffee? And it's really important to notice that, I say that at the start, that um, the word enhancement shouldn't be taken too literally, as these drugs simply enable you to perform to the best of your ability, and they're not giving you any artificial intelligence. Before I move on, I just want to discuss um, dopamine um, in this context. Now, drugs such as Ritalin and Adderall, they work by part by increasing the amount of dopamine in your system. Now, just by um, pure lo the pure lottery of genetics, some people have a gene which causes the breakdown of dopamine to occur at a greater rate, which leaves them with less dopamine. 
Now, dopamine is important in terms of um, boosting your cognition. Now, looking at this, people who are born with better genetics are better at um, certain cognitive tests, and this is definitely not fair. So the use of um, the selective distribution of neuroenhancing drugs can help level the playing field. It also enables students to have a better quality of life. For the example of students, when you look at each day as a 24-hour day as opposed to a 9 to 5, to try and extract as much time as possible to help better our academics. Now the use of nootropics will help us perform at a quicker rate and give us more time to spend like sleeping or spending time with friends, all basic human needs. Now, um, Harvard students um, stated that it's not the people who want to be at the top of their class who are using these nootropics. It's the people who aren't willing to give up these activities, such as even sleeping, um, that will have a detriment on their academics. Now, to further emphasize how underslept students are, I provide some evidence here. And it also helps the ones in need more than the ones who are at the higher end of the sort of intellectual spectrum. Now, Farah stated in her paper that it'll help the lower um, ability ones more than the higher ability ones. And this phenomenon can be explained by the fact that if you are worse off, you have more room to improve than someone who is better off. Now, the British Medical Association also published a paper in 2007 where they stated that the selective use, okay, first of all, education is, should be an equal playing field where everybody has an equal opportunity to um, self-betterment, for self-betterment. Now, the selective use of cognitive enhancing drugs for people from more deprived backgrounds who can't afford um, tutors or whatnot, and people from, and people who aren't as, um, who, do, who aren't as um, intelligent, the selective use of drugs for these individuals will help level the playing field and um, promise a more fruitful education system. It is also, in my opinion, a necessary evil in this society. Now, um, as stated that, um, just an example, there are several businessmen who have ridiculous timings and they have to make meetings all the time where they have to make certain deals at each meeting and they only have one opportunity. Now, in our society, people are willing to undermine the um, small health risks in order to make these deadlines and make these important meetings um, that are implemented on them. And competition in our society is also rapidly growing. And the rules under the use of neuroenhancing drugs aren't as strict from um, the US down to India. And the um, inequality in these rules will um, bring, bring about an inequality in um, the chance that people have in um, performing better um, due to the use of neuroenhancing drugs. Just an example. It's illegal to order modafinil online in the UAE, whilst it's a lot easier to come about it in India. Daniel, I'll just ask you a question. Yeah. What is the problem with modafinil? Why do you think it's illegal in UAE? Are there it's, side effects? The, it's not illegal to actually take it for, um, as a prescription drug, but to order it online, where you don't need a prescription, that's the illegal part. Ah. But you can get it over the counter um, in different countries. And just to, just to end off, um, if its use is already occurring among students, how would you go about stopping it if you are against the use of nootropics? A lot of people already use it. It is a prescription drug, so people can continue to get it. It's easier to online, it's very easy to online in different countries. It only has a 24 hour limit. So if a drug test was implemented, it would have to take place during this, the day itself. And if you were, this was an argument made at the World Scholar Study, <coughs> if there were drug tests implemented, um, before exams, what would, stop, what would stop students from using it during revision? Also, this, is, um, this just gets more worse in terms of adults. And as, as I just mentioned, this was a topic we discussed um, at the World Scholars Cup, so does anybody have any further points in terms of the benefits that they would like to share? Could I ask you something, Daniel? You seem like an advocate of it. Would you take these drugs yourself? 
The only reason I know that Modafinil is legal to order online is because <laughs> Otherwise, on a serious note, though, would you would you be worried that there might be side effects? I'll move on to that. Okay. Okay. So, the drawbacks. As Mr. Flynn stated, the health drawbacks are a major issue, and also morality plays a major issue in terms of the drawbacks. Now, in terms of the health drawbacks, the FDA uh, labeled that um, amphetamines, which are the chemical used in urine hunting drugs, they have a high potential for abuse, they can le lead to addiction, and Adderall has also been stated to have um, cardiac problems associated with it. I've just listed the common side effects for Ritalin. It goes from addiction down to heart palpitations. And on the whole, we actually don't know the long-term health implications of nootropics because, because there aren't much, uh, many studies into this. And people who do take nootropics don't know the health drawbacks that they do possess, so they're putting themselves at risk every time they do take these drugs. And also, as of now, the drugs such as modafinil, I put a link to this um, video in the description, but one person, he took modafinil, and he got um, certain side effects such as ulcers, he couldn't sleep at night, he felt tired throughout the entire day, but he couldn't even sleep. Whilst another person who took the same drug, he was completely fine. He had no side effects, and his um, cognition just improved. So we actually don't really know what's going on. Addiction, as I underlined, in terms of the side effects for Ritalin, plays a major role. As one biochemistry student, he was able to kick off cocaine, but he was never able to kick his addiction with nootropics, um, modafinil in particular. Now, this really confused me because cocaine, after amphetamines, are the second most addictive drug to the human mind. The fact that um, amphetamines, um, sorry, amphetamines used in neuroenhancing drugs have a higher um, addiction um, to people who take it doesn't really make sense. So I'm thinking that um, maybe this has a link towards um, how society um, views the benefits associated with these drugs and people take them to better themselves. And this is the addictive part of these drugs. And as I mentioned at the start, it doesn't really make you smarter in terms of getting, giving you artificial intelligence. And in addition to that, it might even dampen your creativity. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, Chatterjee and Farrell, they both, say, um, they both talked about this. And Drugs that um, further enhance your focus for prolonged periods of time could dampen your creativity. This is because, I don't know about all of you, but for me personally, when I'm most creative, it's when I let my mind roam, when I'm taking a shower, when I go for a walk, and the use of neuro-enhancing drugs that simply make you focus again and again and again may dampen the creativity that people possess. Just some examples, Jimi Hendrix, he thought of Purple Haze, and he claimed that it came to him in a dream. A chemist, he looked at a benzene ring, which is a carbon um, structure, and he stated that this came to him, this idea came to him, when he saw an image of a snake biting its own tail. That's really interesting. And studies that look into different types of cognition, as opposed to the three that I mentioned at the start, they don't really exist. And the studies that do exist, they're really few, and the data that they possess is really contradictory amongst each other. So, stuff such as abstract thought, creativity, studies haven't really been done into this. So we can't really say that new tropics do make you smarter. And it's, in my opinion, that's pretty much um, definitely not fair. And um, students stated that it's not the people who, um, as I mentioned, who just want to sleep more who are actually using these drugs, but it's actually the people who have a GPA 3.0 or lower, they're the people who take drugs more, they're 20, 20 times more likely to actually do cocaine. And the fact is that these are the individuals that um, are spending too much time partying than they're willing to, get, to give up. And these are the individuals who are willing to break the laws or bend the laws at the expense of harder working people. And this isn't exactly moral in my eyes. And also when you do complete a task, when you achieve that high grade, the main benefit of that, to me personally, is the pride that I feel, that I've actually completed this by myself through my own determination. But people who do achieve high grades through the use of nootropics, they'll feel like their, heart, their success is run down to the nootropics. 
And without that, they're nothing. And I think that's a really big psychological impact. And it will ruin society. It'll further propagate a stressful society that we live in, where we're forced, where we're forced to work even harder due to our maximized potential, due to us being able to work harder. Um, we'll only um, have more and, work, more and more work placed onto us, as opposed to the idea that you'll have more free time. Now this can definitely lead to burnout and lead to a society where we just overwork. And it's already not entirely legal uh, in the eyes of the law. Um, Cephalin didn't um, invent a neuro enhancing drug, but they simply advertised um, Provigil as a drug that can cure tiredness, and they were fined $425 um, dollars just for doing this. And the case study that I saw, the YouTube video that I yet again posted, um, put the link down at the end of this PowerPoint. There was a university student who had a scholarship at her US university. However, they, find, they found out that she was using Adderall, and they, they quickly took away her scholarship. And she was left with no formal um, higher education. Cambridge University also disproves this use amongst the students. A contradictory point to the disadvantages is I saw um, an article, and it was quoted from a Cambridge University student, and he did take nootropics, but he was in a natural science degree in his final year, his exams were coming up, but he was met with uh, a family emergency. He had to go for the passing away of a family member. He came back, and he was so devastated during the event, he had no time to revise, and he took these nootropics, and he passed. So, is their use really immoral when uh, we're faced with events that are beyond our control? Which is something we should consider. And it's also not allowed to work with alcohol in the UV. So are there any further points in terms of disadvantages? Or any questions? I remember reading about um, this journalist from Independent, Ed Harry, and he experimented with these himself. And he said that for three days his writing was absolutely fantastic. He said that normally he felt about 10% of focus. Um, he said that he focused on the focus of the China. But then he said that after three days, his writing deteriorated, he lacked focus, and he said, and he said it lasted for months afterwards. It was almost like all his subconscious was being brought to his conscious and exhausted him, and it took him months to get out of that. So that was quite interesting. Yeah. It also has different effects on different people. And for certain people, that, um, that can take place, and they can use lots of sleep due to that. But for some people, the, the side effects don't really exist. Um, do you know how you said that like, you might become less creative? Is it only in those 24 hours or for the rest of the world? Um, the statement that it's less creative was um, by two neuroscientists, and there is no real evidence to back this up, but it's just an idea. And I feel like the prolonged use of this might um, reduce your creativity. And there was just an article that I came across with a um, pretty interesting fact. By the nature, um, it was, they had an online poll where they asked questions to several people online, several volunteers. And the questions, the, fir the first question was, um, how many of you have actually used nootropics? One out of five of them said they have. Um, a majority of them said that healthy adults should be permitted to take brain boosters for non-medical reasons. 69% that mild side effects were an acceptable risk due to the society that we live in, I guess. And the majority said that drugs should not be made available to children who had no diabetes or medical conditions. So there was a stark con contrast between adults using these drugs versus children using these drugs. And one third of them admitted that they would feel pressure to give these drugs to their children if they found out that other parents were doing so. <laughs> so yeah. You can use that for your using the links that I was talking about, I was talking about. And if you don't really have time to go through any of these, because I know exams are approaching, I would still highly recommend that you actually go through the first article, because that had a majority of the information that I actually got. And it really dwells on this topic for several separate pages. And Mr. Flynn just wanted me to define cosmetic neurology, but it was actually coined by Chatterjee in 2004. And as you can see on the board, this is the practice of using drugs developed for um, recognized medical conditions to strengthen ordinary cognition. That's just a definition. It's just in the world's power's compass. Um, so, yes, I can And I'm just going to um, lightly brush over cosmetic 
um, infidelity. Now, it was under the additional cases um, to actually research. And the question posed was, is concealing plastic surgery from romantic partners a form of cheating? I don't have a firm opinion on this. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, the definition of infidelity is the action or state of being unfaithful to a spouse. So it doesn't have the connotations of having a romantic relationship with another person during a relationship, but it's just the state of being unfaithful. Now, one third of it hide it from their spouses, and it's a growing trend, so this number is likely to increase. In almost all the cases, are women who are um, going through cosmetic, doing cosmetic And I'm going to treat this the same way. I'm going to talk about yes, it is cheating, and then no, it's not cheating. And I'm just going to warn you now, the arguments that I came across were quite weird throughout many articles, but they're all the same. This is a strange topic. But first of all, yes, it is cheating due to the money, due to the money wasted and the honesty um, that's trampled upon. Now, one patient actually stated that um, when she was talking about her husband, that he wouldn't want me to spend all this money. Now, just thinking about that, thinking about the the lies that she's had to. That, that she's had to tell the state of being unfaithful, which is the actual definition of infidelity, just threw out one quote. Now, it is also considered by many as a frivolous act, as a waste of money, as um, the average cost of Botox is $392, and that's not even because money surgery, but for liposuction, it's 40,000 AUD for five liters of fat, 5,000 centimeters cubed if you're taking that as water, that's only five kilograms. Now, people who are heavily overweight would need to do this multiple, multiple times. And it's also hiding large sums of money from your spouse, which is also being in an unfaithful state. And is that cheating? You can decide for that yourself. And some patients pay with cash, others split it, other pay half in cash, half in credit. These sort of FBI tactics are just used to make sure that their spouses don't find out that they've actually used this money. And this appears to be someone who is cheating. Um, I guess. One argument that I saw, I didn't really want to mention this, but there was a study done in the personality and social. Basically, it said that men are worse off in remembering their partner's appearances, and they stated that women who are doing this are taking advantage of their husband's inability to actually recognize their appearance. I don't know. <laughs> of a relationship. When you think of cheating within the context of a relationship, you think of someone um, going out and having a romantic relationship, relationship with someone else. Now, if you think about that, and if you think about your partner coming up to you and saying that, I just want to spend some money on myself, and I was kind of embarrassed to tell you um, that I did it, the two can't be compared. So brushing them under the same stroke of cheating um, shouldn't really be done. And also, just to end off, society um, can be given the blame for cosmetic infidelities, take the blame of the women who are going through this. Just put yourself in the position of a woman who is doing cosmetic infidelity. On one side, you have society's pressure telling you to look a certain age for your entire life. On the other side, you have society telling you um, in the opposite direction that spending money on yourself is frivolous, is a waste of money, and it causes embarrassment. Now, with these two mixed together, I feel that cosmetic infidelity will continue on for almost forever. These are the links. Just one more thing I just wanted to mention was, um, in the history of cheating, it talks about under business cheating, um, tax evasion. If you come across the Panama Papers in the news, just take some notes, because mm -hmm. they might bring that up. And thank you, Mr. Flynn, for letting this happen, and that's all I have to say today. It was great. Thank, thank you. you.